Good morning. Happy New Year. This also happens to be the first Sunday after Christmas, or as a friend of mine refers to it, National Guest Preacher Sunday. <laughs> so I am your guest preacher. For those who may not know me, my name is Dale Russell. I'm a member of the Elder Board here at the Bridge. Um, I've often been up on stage as part of the worship team, but this is my first time preaching here. Um, I have preached before, though, mostly in Haiti. The good news for you is that I'm accustomed to preaching through a translator, so I usually make my messages about half as long as they normally would be otherwise. The bad news is that Haitian church services can be several hours long, so <laughs> it all kind of evens out. My last missions trip wasn't to Haiti, but to a Haitian church in the Dominican Republic. Um, they told me there was going to be a church conference, and I should be ready to preach. So I actually brought three sermons with me that I'd all preached before, so I'd have a few to choose from. But when I got off the plane, they said, oh, no, the conference is all week, and you're preaching every night. So I gave five sermons that week. Uh, the first was on the night that I arrived on a passage that had been previously selected for the conference, although they'd forgotten to tell me that. Um, with help from the translator, who is an excellent pastor himself, I got through that first night. Um, I gave all three of the sermons I'd brought, but I still needed one more. This was when we at the bridge were in the middle of our series on discipleship. So that topic was very much in my mind. And as I came across this passage in the second chapter of Philippians, it really resonated with me, and I spoke on that. So since I've already confessed that I have a habit of recycling sermons, I hope you won't mind if I share that same passage with you this morning. You can think of it as kind of a refresher course on our study of discipleship that we recently completed. So please turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and I'll be looking at the first 18 verses, uh, but I'll read just a few verses at a time, starting with verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Translation, uh, which will be up on the screen, or you can just follow along in whatever translation you have. So Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This passage, and the whole book of Philippians really, is all about joy, but it's a particular kind of joy. It's the joy of a spiritual mentor, or in the terms of our recent sermon series, a discipler who's rejoicing to see his children flourishing. And yet, this joy is deeper than just a carefree happiness. It's joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. In the very first verse, Paul talks about encouragement. Well, you only talk about encouragement when there are reasons to be discouraged. He talks about consolation or comfort. Well, those are things that you only talk about when there's something that you need to be consoled for. He talks about fellowship. Well, you only talk about fellowship when there's a shadow of loneliness hanging over you. It's interesting the way Paul phrases this. If there is any encouragement, consolation, fellowship, this kind of leaves it open as to whether he's talking about these things for himself or for his readers. Well, the last few verses of the preceding chapter make it pretty clear that it's both. The last few verses of the first chapter of Philippians, Paul says that his readers are engaged in the same conflict that they saw he had and that he still has. So our encouragement comes from Christ. The fact of the incarnation of the Son of God in Jesus Christ gives us life, purpose, lets us know that we have incredible value and are loved by the God of the universe. Paul says that we get comfort from love. This is the love of God in sending his son. It's also the love of fellow believers made possible through God's love. Paul says that our fellowship comes from the Holy Spirit. 
You may have heard the Greek word used here for fellowship, koinonia. It refers to a bond among believers that's made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul isn't down in the dumps looking to be cheered up here. He really is speaking from a place of joy already. And he says it just needs one thing to be complete. Paul was the founder of this church. He was their spiritual father. In the terms of the sermon series that we recently completed, he was their discipler. What he wants, the one thing he's looking for to complete his joy, is to see unity in spirit of those he loves. His desire is to see them working in harmony for the gospel. Well, how is this possible? There's incredible diversity in the church that he's writing to. Uh, historians tell us that Philippi was a city that prided itself on its identity as part of the Roman Empire. And yet the people mentions, that mentioned by Paul in this book all have Greek-sounding names. So you've got the Greeks and the Romans in there together. The church was started among the Jews and yet now has a large number of Gentiles. Paul mentions both men and women who are hardworking, devoted servants of the church. Very likely, there were even slaves and slave owners fellowshipping together all in the same church. So how can they live together in harmony, let alone work together for the gospel? Even in the church, there can be strife and disagreements. So how can we fulfill God's commands to love one another and work together to build his kingdom? Well, the answer is in verses 3 and 4. Paul says, don't act out of selfishness or conceit, but put the needs of others above your own. Well, that's easy, right? No, it isn't easy. It isn't even difficult. It's impossible, at least on our own strength. So how do we do it? Paul tells us to look to the example of Jesus Christ, the Son of God made flesh. So let's continue reading verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Scholars generally think that this section that I've just read is an early hymn to Jesus Christ. Maybe a hymn that was written by Paul himself, or maybe he's quoting it here. I think it's particularly appropriate to look at this passage at this time of year when we've just been focusing on the Incarnation. But while Christmas reminds us that the second person of the Trinity came as a humble infant, he was so much more than just a baby. In the words of one of my favorite Christmas carols, echoing the opening verses of the Gospel of John, he was the word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could rightfully have claimed the glory of God, but he voluntarily set it aside, became a man, died a horrible death, and for that, God has highly exalted him so that the name of Jesus, everyone should bow and acknowledge him as the Lord. I want to say a little something in particular about verse 7. He emptied himself. Well, what exactly does that mean? There's been a lot of debate over this among theologians. Uh, theologians generally refer to this as kenosis, which is a Greek word meaning emptying. There's a lot of mystery surrounding this. There's some things that we know from Scripture and some things we can only speculate on. So here's what we know. We know that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. We know that Jesus had the power of God. He had power over nature, over demons, over disease. 
He calmed storms. He healed lepers. He did many miraculous works that only God could do. We know that he didn't always choose to exercise that power. He didn't heal every sick person in the entire world. Storms still happened. We know that when he did choose to exercise his divine power, it was always for a purpose. And that purpose was to do the will of his father. Just a side note here, as I read the accounts of Jesus' life in the Gospels, what strikes me isn't so much the miracles that he performed as how often he refrained from performing miracles. Jesus could have lived a life free from pain and inconvenience. He could have just made all of those inconveniences go away, and yet he chose not to. Can you imagine how much restraint that must have taken? So those are the things we know. Here are some things we can only speculate on. Jesus grew up speaking Aramaic. Did he have to learn it as a child, or was he born knowing it? If I could go back in time and talk to Jesus during his time on earth, would he speak English? Did Joseph teach Jesus anything about carpentry? Or was Jesus already a perfect carpenter and a perfect everything else? We know that Jesus sometimes knew things beyond human knowledge. Uh, just one example is when he saw Nathanael under the fig tree. You can read about this in John 1, verse 48. Did he know things like that all the time and just not say them out loud? Or could he choose when to know things and when to not know things in order to serve the will of his Father? I have some opinions about all of those questions. And I'm not going to tell you what they are. Because <laughs> my opinions are just speculations. And I'm not here to tell you my opinions, my speculations. I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong to speculate. To tell you the truth, I think it's kind of fun. And sometimes it really does help me spiritually to imagine what Jesus' life on earth was like from his perspective. So maybe over lunch with family and friends, you can talk together and engage in your own speculation. Did Jesus ever trip or stub his toe? Is the Christmas carol correct when it says, no crying he makes? Did Jesus as a toddler have to be toilet trained? I'm not going to tell you because I don't know, but speculate. What do you think? Just two cautions if you do want to speculate about these things. First, if it leads to any kind of argument, if you wind up getting mad at someone whose opinion differs from yours, stop immediately because you're doing it wrong. After all, this is in the middle of a passage illustrating how Jesus gave, an, gave us an example of humility, putting the needs of others above his own so that we can live together in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Anything that leads to hard feelings goes directly counter to that. Second, speculation is fine so long as you remember that that's what it is. Having opinions about all these questions is fine. Elevating those opinions to the level of Scripture is not. Your opinion or mine about any of these questions is not a hill to die on. The points I mentioned earlier, the things that come from Scripture, those are all hills to die on, or better yet, to live on. Leaving our speculations and getting back to what Scripture tells us, verse 8 says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. This is the source of our salvation, the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How exactly does that work? Well, again, there are things that remain a mystery to us, but the Word of God tells us what we need to know. Several years ago, you probably remember, a movie came out, The Passion of the Christ. Um, it vividly portrays the suffering and death of Jesus at the hands of the Romans. I was talking with a seeker friend after the movie, when, when the movie, uh, she had seen the movie and she had some questions about it. Her response to that movie was, yeah, sure, Jesus suffered horribly and he was innocent, 
But lots and lots of people suffered horribly under the Roman Empire and other, un, under other brutal regimes before and after, even up to today. And many of those who suffer and die are innocent, at least of the crimes that they're being punished for. Well, the difference between Jesus and everyone else who has ever suffered and died is who it is that was doing the suffering. Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever been both God and man. Only as a man can he pay the penalty for the sins of man. Only as God can he be perfect, sinless, so that he doesn't deserve the penalty himself, can take that penalty from us and impute his righteousness to us. Only as God is his sacrifice sufficient to pay the penalty not for himself, but for the entire human race. Only as God can he defeat death and rise again. Only as man can his victory over death be something that we can now share in, so that not only does he experience the resurrection, but he promises it to us as well. Because of all of this, this hymn section tells us that God the Father has exalted Jesus and given him the name above all names, that at his name every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Well, that's pretty amazing, and yet we're not done there. The lordship of Jesus obviously has eternal consequences. Someday, every created being will bow, willingly or unwillingly, and acknowledge him as Lord. But more than that, it has consequences for how we live our lives today, here and now. Let's continue reading, verses 12 to 16. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I can take pride, because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain. Well, now we come to the so what section. Jesus Christ, who is and was both God and man, took on flesh, lived a sinless life, died for the sins of all mankind, rose and lives again to the glory of God the Father. So what? And by so what, I don't mean this is no big deal, because obviously it's a huge deal. I mean, so what do we need to do about it? We must obey. Paul says we need to work out our salvation. Now, when he says we have to work out our salvation, that does not mean we have to figure out how to be saved. That's already been done through the work of Jesus Christ. What it does mean is we need to figure out what it means for each of us to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The fear and trembling here tells us that this is serious business, and it is. To work out your salvation is to figure out what God wants you to do with the one and only life that he's given you here on earth. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ has paid the ultimate sacrifice to redeem your life. So what are you going to do with it? There are aspects of this that are the same for everyone, and there are aspects that are different for every believer. Paul doesn't talk much about the parts that are unique to each individual, and really there's no way that he could. These are the questions like, where should I go to school? What career do I enter? What ministries should I pour my energies into? 
How do I invest my time, talent, and treasure? The salvation that Jesus Christ has given us has a profound impact on all of these questions. And yet, the answers may be different for every believer. In fact, they may be different for a single believer over the course of their life. When it comes to finding God's will for your life, I don't believe there's a single answer that you find once and you do it and then you're done and after that you retire from finding God's will. Rather, it's a lifelong process of figuring out what God, how God wants me to use each day he's given me for his glory and for the building up of his kingdom and his people. Since that is unique to each person, Paul doesn't say much about it here. He does have a few things to say about the part of working out our salvation that's common to all believers. In verse 13, Paul says that we're doing the work of God here on earth, doing things that bring joy to the heart of God. And then in verse 14, he tells us again not to grumble and complain. This is the one thing that Paul decides to focus on. And it's not so much a matter of outward obedience as it is the state of our heart. This goes back to his earlier exhortation to follow the example of Christ by humbling ourselves, putting the needs of others above our own. I don't know about you, but when I'm complaining, which happens more often than I'd like to admit, it usually means that I'm thinking about my own needs. I'm not getting what I want, and that's not acceptable, so I complain about it. If I'm focused on the needs of others, I'm a whole lot less likely to grumble and complain. Paul says if we do this, if we do the will of God without complaining, that's going to make us different from the, from the world around us. Paul says if we do this, we will be like lights in the world. What stands out, what makes us different, is our good deeds, yes, but even more, it's the fact that we're doing them without complaining. That's what sets us apart from the world. I think sometimes if I stopped complaining at work, people would look at me and say, who are you and what have you done with Dale? But they would also realize that there's something different, um, that I'm not like everyone else in the office because complaining is just a pervasive part of our culture, including my own heart. This is where Paul's disciples' heart really shines through. Paul's been talking about having a spirit of humility, and yet there's one thing about which he says he takes pride, and that's seeing his spiritual children hold fast the word of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, keeping their innocence in a crooked and perverse generation and doing it all without grumbling or complaining. When he sees that, he knows that whatever he's done on their behalf hasn't been in vain. What do these efforts look like? Well, let's keep, keep reading verses 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, Rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So we return to where we started, with joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. Paul says he's being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice of their faith. This refers back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, where an animal was sacrificed on the altar, and then the priest would pour out wine as a drink offering on top of that. And the two together were considered to constitute a single act of sacrificial service to God. Paul uses this metaphor to say that he feels himself like he is the drink offering that's being poured out for the sake of those he loves. I'm sure some of you can identify with that. Parents, do you ever feel like you've been poured out for the sake of your kids? Teachers, small group leaders, and yet, isn't it all worth it when you see that your work hasn't been in vain? So finally, in verse 18, Paul invites his spiritual children to join him 
in this sacrifice of worship, and then to join them in the joy that results from it. This is the heart of a discipler, to take joy in seeing God's people living, working, and serving together in the unity of the Holy Spirit. I know this is the heart of Pastor Todd and all of the staff here at the bridge, and it's the heart of your elder board, our small group leaders, ministry leaders, children's church workers, and everyone here who is investing their time and energy to help others come to know God more deeply. It's the heart of all of you who are reaching out to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your friends and neighbors. All of you who serve up front or behind the scenes in his name and to his glory. To all of you who are prayer warriors engaged in spiritual battle that most of us may know nothing about. To all of you and to all who love God and have experienced salvation through Jesus Christ, we say with Paul, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for the joy that you give us in serving you together as a body. Father, thank you for the faithful body believers at this church, for the many hearts of service to you. Father, we thank you for those who are in positions of leadership, as well as those who serve behind the scenes, everyone who is faithfully filling your will, your will for their lives. Lord, we ask your help and your guidance, especially in this new year, as we figure out what it means for each of us to follow you. Lord, there are things that we know, and we need your help with those. We need your help to have a, a spirit of service without complaining. But Lord, there are things that each of us needs to figure out for ourselves, how you have called each of us to be one part of your body, to use the gifts that you have uniquely given each of us. Father, Father, we thank you and praise you that you have built us together as a body, each unique and yet working for a common purpose to spread the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we rejoice in the salvation you've given us. It's in your son's name we pray.